Oh, so we can only the main session of the day. Um, Paul was all the way here from Norway. He is here for a week. He's got a fairly fascinating set of slides. Uh, I'm sure some of you must have seen this on SlideShare. Uh, how many of you actually looked at the slides before you came here? Great. So there's a fair number of you. So I trust you know he's going to have a fairly interesting 90 minutes ahead of you. So I will hope you. Excellent. Thank you very much. <laughs> and uh, Kira, thanks for inviting me here. You know, <coughs> for me, C and C++ has become kind of a, like a relation. I feel like we have discovered something and we need to tell the world about the things that we have discovered because most people don't know this. Even C and C programmers struggle with some of the concepts <laughs> that I'm not going to present today. Um, so, as a missionary, I take every opportunity that uh, where I can kind of spread the gospel. So thanks for inviting me. So uh, more than half of you raised your hand uh, when you had uh, that you had seen the, the deep sea slides on SlideShare. But uh, just checking, how many C programmers in the room who program C? Former C programmer. Hmm? Some kind of former C programmer. Uh, okay, let's first to. Uh, how many have, have ever programmed any C program? Okay, that's all I'm asking. <laughs> How many programmed uh, C during the last week? Okay, a few of <laughs> you. Cool. So, <clears throat> how many programmers have done C++ uh, the last week? Okay, so there are a few C++ programmers as well. Um, I will add... Um, this is not so much about C++, but nearly everything I talk about today, or actually everything I talk about today, also applies to C++. And I have some few slides in hand, which is more or less all about C++, but I doubt that I don't have that one. Look, uh, come there. <coughs> so, just to get started, um, as a programmer, we feel that we are masters of the universe. We are very, very confident. Oh yeah, oh yeah, I know how to command this machine to do whatever I want. But the more experience you get, the more often you know what happens once in a while. <coughs> you get bitten. <laughs> and you get bitten by unintentional bugs, sometimes. And sometimes you get bitten because there was something you didn't really know that you should have known. And if you had known this, you wouldn't get the problem in the first place. And this is the motivation and the reason uh, why we uh, developed this uh, slide. Uh, I'm doing this work together with John Jagger. Um, because we realized that most programmers are not able to reason about a piece of code like this. So I'm now going to ask you to make sure that you sit next to someone um, so that you can together discuss what do you think will happen if you try to compile, link, and execute this program. So make sure you discuss with someone uh, closely. I would like to hear some <laughs> so please start the discussion with the person next to you. Try to reason about the flow, the execution flow, and the values calculated, and so on. And please find the pen and paper. If you don't have the pen and paper, uh, you've got some paper. In the we have some uh, paper as well, sir, so that you can write down what you think it will be. I will not have it. Well, write down on the paper. paper. I think so. I 
And for those who are not discussing with the partners now, I really encourage you to do so because it's so much more fun than the rest of the exercises uh, that we're going to do. Um, <coughs> Okay, you have had the chance to look at this uh, example now. <laughs> Anyone wants to give a comment about this code? No return. Hmm? No return. You say it doesn't return? It doesn't have a return. It doesn't have a return. Oh, um, yeah, that's valid comments, but uh, this is uh, C99. Okay. So for the last 14 years, you didn't have to add return on the end of uh, main, actually. Because uh, C99 adopted uh, from the uh, C++ standard, where if you don't return from main, um, it will always return success to the execution environment. So this is perfectly valid code. Uh, when it comes to the return, yes. <laughs> All right, any wants, wants to suggest a number? What is going to be printed out, you think, maybe? Yeah. Nine. Nine, a hair over here? Eleven. 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 Anyone better? Thirteen. <laughs> 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 what did you say? Ten. Ten? Seven. Seven? Thirteen. 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 Oh, you're, you're the top winner now. <laughs> Anyone better than 13? 15. <laughs> oh, no. No, no, I, I think that I was trying to compete with him. All right, okay. Does anyone want to say more than anything, more than 15? Because then you win. <laughs> the thing is, this code can print out absolutely anything. And absolutely anything can happen with this code. If you write this one in Java, you are guaranteed a particular result. If you write it in C, all bets are off, anything can happen. So, I do actually happen to have three different compilers on my machine. So, if I compile it <laughs> with the GCC version that comes with uh, Mac OS, the operating system, which is GCC 4.2.1, which is a fairly old one, but it's still the one that ships with the operating system, I get 12. If I compile it with Clang, which is now kind of the default favorite uh, compiler uh, for Mac, I get 11. If I compile it with uh, official, deeply serious Intel compiler, I get 30. What is the problem here? What, what is it that we don't understand? Or most programmers don't understand? What part the plus plus does happen? Yes. You are onto something here. I have another suggestion. Uh, when the compiler makes a token out of it, the in order the precedence or left to right or right to left. That is why I value is a more important role. I value is a final I value plus index of V. Mm -hmm. Or is it from left to right if it is traversing? It makes a difference. Yeah. You're certainly onto something. Um, it has uh, nothing to do with precedence, but it has to do with evaluation order, which we are into now. Because 
the evaluation order in C and C++ is not specified. And that means you will not know, exactly as you say, you will not know when the side effect take, takes place. There is no rule that dictates when the side effects take place inside uh, evaluating an expression. Well, there are hardly any rules. But. So, how can we kind of... This is dangerous, isn't it? There is no warnings here. What should we do? As C programmers, we know that we have to try to get some warnings. How can we do that? Wall. Wall is your friend. Not only wall, you have to put on Vextra and Pedantic. And also, if you compile with optimization, you get even more error messages. So let's give it a try. <laughs> You will not, you cannot rely on you actually getting warning for this. There is no requirement in the C and C++ standard that it has to diagnose this kind of code. And the problem is that this is now undefined behavior. So if you have undefined behavior anywhere in your code, the whole code base, basically, is undefined behavior. And this is what we're going to talk about today. <clears throat> Another thing, and this is what I suspect adds to the confusion. It seems like most programmers treat C and C++ as a high-level language. And I argue that it's not really a high-level language. It's not a high-level language as you expect from Java, C Sharp, Ruby, Python, and we can also mention Closure, Lisp, or oh, Haskell, all of these languages are kind of high abstraction from the underlying architecture. This one, C and C++, they should be treated as portable assemblers, because that's what they are. They sometimes manage to hide the fact that they are portable assemblers, but if you forget about it, then you end up with uh, these problems that we just saw. We have a piece of code that gives all kinds of results, and we don't know why. <coughs> so without deep understanding of the language, the history and its design, you are doomed to fail when you program C++. <coughs> and this concerned us um, a lot. We have been working for years uh, already, teaching C and C++. I have been interviewing hundreds and hundreds of developers. And I saw this kind of recurring pattern of not deeply understand the concept. So there were some strange explanations of what uh, was going on there. So we published this uh, slide deck. And uh, we thought that someone would be interested in it. But we were quite amazed when we saw the reaction. So there were like, uh, I think that was like 20,000 downloads the first, uh, first hours after we published it. And uh, I think it has now fired up again. I think it was now 10,000 times today uh, due to uh, uh, some Twitter storm, uh, etc. But it's, uh, it's, it's a slide deck that has uh, now been read by many and we have received lots of email and a response where people are asking, where can we find more information about this? And initially we thought, oh, that's no problem, we can tell you, and then we start to look. There is no books out there that talks about these things, and there are hardly any courses you can attend that talk about these things. The best book is probably uh, Peter van der Linden, Deep uh, Expert C Knowledge. No, ex C programs. C programs. Expert C Programming. Deep Deep Sea Secrets. Deep Sea Secrets, yeah, yeah. Somewhere. That's a subtitle. Um, and then there are a few books about um, security that also talks about these things. But apart from that, there is not much. So therefore we felt we need to spread the word. So let's start with the basics here now. Okay? Now, we are not going to only talk about the problems, we are also start with the basics here. What is this one going to print out? <coughs> 
No, it's not a trick question. It's exactly what you can do. Four, 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 four. Excellent! Four, four, four! There we go. What is this one going to bring now? Four faces. Four faces. Four faces. Four, five, six. Good. What about this? Garbage? What about it? I heard. One, one, two, three. 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 One, two, in C++, <laughs> objects with static storage duration is initialized to its default value, which for native types, it means zero. But um, he's not sure about that. But he has a strategy. Oh, I have no problem. I don't even know that because I just, I always add it to, to something. The thing is that as you work as a programmer, sometimes you have to read code that other writes and understand it. So there is no excuse to say, well, I don't do it, so I don't need to know about it. Because you're working together with someone, and therefore you need to know these things. So this is guaranteed. This program will take one to two. But what happens now? Garbage, garbage, garbage? Garbage, garbage plus one, garbage plus two. No, no, yeah, garbage plus one. Yeah, you're onto something. Maybe. Well, this happens a lot in the... Depends on the C compiler. This, this happens actually a lot with programmers that generalize on one, they try to take knowledge from one place and then generalize it onto another place. So Larry just heard that uh, static was initialized to zero, so therefore, huh? are they one on one maybe? No. <coughs> because objects or variables with automatic storage duration are not initialized implicitly. Is it garbage? Uh, this is also an example of undefined behavior, so absolutely anything can happen. Absolutely anything can happen. But the question here is, why is static variables, or static variables, uh, why do they get the default value, while automatic variables do not get the default value? Because there is a reason for it. They need to be consistent. Uh, Sorry? They need it. They are uh, supposed to be consistent in the data. Now the runtime linker can set it. Yeah, runtime linker. Well, yeah, you're on to something. Yeah. Any more suggestions? Yeah, uh, the automatic variables are on the stack, and the stack would contain whatever was previously there. The suggestion is that automatic variables are on the stack. In, the, in, in uh, practice, that is what very often happens. But at the same time, if you look in the C standard, the concept of a stack is never mentioned. So this idea that automatic variables goes on the stack is something that very often happens. But if if you think that always happens, then you will get into other type of problems. So yeah, that's really true. Yeah. yeah. Any more, other suggestions to this answer? It's expensive to mention stack. I like that. It is expensive to to uh, initialize automatically uh, or, or variables with automatic storage duration, while it is not so expensive to initialize variables with static storage duration. Because what typically happens when you start a C program is that the operating system will load the program into memory, and then it will pass the um, program counter to a label called starch which is usually in the C runtime library. And the C runtime library will do some initialization. And one of the initialization it will do, typically, is just to do manset over the whole area, manset zero over the whole area of uh, static variables. This is what usually happens in practice. Uh, so, and, and it's something that happens once before you start a program. 
if the automat uh, variables with automatic storage duration should get an initial value, that would add extra commands for every time you enter a block. For example, every time you enter a function or whatever. So there are many, I, I heard several good suggestions about why um, this is so and uh, And it's not always about C being a difficult language because there is a reason for these kind of things. <coughs> His name is Ed, by the way. <laughs> <coughs> okay, and that's true that a lot of uh, questions in C and C++, the answer is because of optimization or efficiency. All right, let's go back to our example here. This is exactly the same as we saw earlier. Let's try it in my machine because something is the theoretical part, the other thing is the practical part. What? happens when I run it on my machine? Ooh. This is kind of scary, especially if you tend to be the type that generalizes over seeing one example, and then, then it's always like this. <coughs> Does anyone have a plausible explanation for this one? You do the same stack in your phone, it's using the same register. Yeah. In this case, First of all, it's undefined behavior, so anything can happen. But this is actually executing, and let's see, this is a phenomenon that happens. <coughs> and being able to explain that like you just did now, the reason is that it's the same memory area that is used over and over again. So just like you said, it's a garbage value, plus one, plus two, plus three. And the garbage value, when you compile without optimization with GCC, very often happens to be zero. Because GCC tries to be helpful by uh, by map setting the stacky area as well. Uh, I think that's the page pulled from dev zero. From so the, the allocator pulls a page from dev zero by default. Um, I'm sure that depends on the architecture. Um, that's the reason why stacks tend to be zero. Okay. Yeah. Could be. <coughs> Larry might have heard something, might have read on, on uh, Stack Overflow or, or read some articles or books or overheard someone that is quote, or oh, maybe have even read the C standard. And he just remembers the sentence. Oh, no, yeah, it's because the value of an object with automatic storage duration is used while it is indeterminate. And this is exact knowledge. This is kind of exact theoretical. It's, it's uh, kind of the the best direct answer, but it doesn't explain this phenomenon. And there are a lot of programmers out there that thinks it's okay just to know a lot of these sentences and say, because of that, I'm not doing that. But that doesn't help you when you're trying to deeper code that other separate things or process on you with someone else. <coughs> and Larry also thinks that uh, as long as it's uh, undefined behavior, I don't need to care about this. I think that is wrong. I think you need to learn enough about practical implementations and typical execution environments so that you are able to reason about these things even if it's undefined behavior. Because that helps you a lot. You can actually, by understanding this deeply, you don't need to know all the sentences in the standard uh, in order to program and C and C++ correctly. And in this case, the explanation you gave, that it's probably the same stack area, gives you an insight into how a C program executes. That might help you avoid this type of things. Because... <coughs> You won't get help from the compiler. Always. You're not guaranteed to get help. And the question now is, why do you think C, the C standard, doesn't uh, require that you always get a warning or an error on the inbound code? Can I have a suggestion on that? It's not even cool. Hmm? It is not even cool. 
Well, it is. Uh, it was in Malik called, or actually, it's, it's not really called in Malik. It's called ill formed, and it's it's not well formed. So the standard says that if it's not, if you don't have a defined behavior, then anything can happen. So I I agree. It's a bit sloppy to call it in Malik code. It's actually called ill formed. If that was what you're looking why, when you had ill formed code, why don't you get the diagnostic message? Why doesn't the C standard kind of say, to be a C compliant uh, compiler, you have to issue warnings when the programmer is writing crap code? There is a extra work for the compiler. Hmm? Extra work for the compiler. If you are certainly onto something, it's extra work for the compiler. There is a deeper reason for it. Uh, <laughs> we could also exploit the architectural uh, specific thing. Yeah, we can. can. But uh, my answer is closer. Efficiency. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's always a good answer for it. No, that's not the case. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry for leaving me with uh, that, Alec. Then it's recent. Is that being able to diagnose, uh, diagnose um, um, uh, ill formed code is a very difficult task. Writing a compiler is already very difficult. Writing a compiler that can print out warning messages when you write crap is even more difficult. And C is a systems programming language. It wants to be the best language to implement first on any kind of, uh, well, after a machine code, of course, on any CPU out there. So it would be a draconian requirement to impose a compiler writer to the warnings of crap code. So instead of, as it is now, there is, I, I think I've heard it saying that um, for a new, completely new architecture and uh, CPU, it should be possible for an experienced compiler writer to write a C compiler, a compliant C compiler, in like, in like a few months. But if you add this requirement of having to put out diagnostic for crack code, you might need hundreds of developers working for 10 years before you have a compliant compiler. So even if you have some compilers out there that are able to give you warnings about this, you shouldn't expect C compilers to give you any type of warnings, really. The C standard is very relaxed about what you need to diagnose and what this... Uh, and basically, it's saying, if it's not valid code, you can do whatever you want. That's the short version of what the standard says. There are tools to help you with these things if you're interested. Big tools, cover D and link. Yes, good point. There are, uh, the issue was that there are tools out there that can help you with this. And Coverity was mentioned, uh, Lint, uh, Clockworks. Clockworks. I should have mentioned more because <laughs> there are really good tools out there. But they will, they will also, they will, they will take you at, at just some way, but they won't be able to detect that. So that is the reason why I want to always get one some errors on the moving code. Because it should be relatively easy to write C. As a C compiler. So, let's look at this one again. There is something you can do in addition to adding one more extra pedantic, and that is to always compile with optimization. This is a good thing. Because if you compile with optimization, you force the compiler to consider a larger context of what it's doing. And therefore, it might be able to see that you're trying to use A initialized. If you compile without optimization, it is just scanning through the, the code and, and uh, compiling it into a assembly language, and that's it. It doesn't, it never sees that you're trying to, uh, to update an initialized variable. Another thing is that you will typically get garbage out. You really can see garbage coming out when you compile with optimization. And the garbage is 
very often, especially on uh, high-end target machines, it's very often not the same. By the way, I just saw this one uh, earlier today and thought about it. Does anyone here know why, uh, give a plausible explanation for why these kind of garbage values are different? They're registered. They're addresses. Hmm? They're addresses in memory. Yeah, the addresses, but... Uh, they're read from registers. So yeah, but why are they different every time we kind of start it? Because in some way we, we would think that the uh, initial it's garbage would be executed, hmm? not sequentially. It's optimized. It, so it might be yeah, executed in sequence. It is actually intentional. Why it's different here? Any suggestion? I don't remember exactly the word for it, but it's a security mechanism that was exactly. implemented in uh, several operating systems around 10 years ago. And it's uh, to defeat, uh, to um, kind of defend against stack smashing and things like that. Stack entries. And, yeah, and, and uh, kind of stack overflows and, and hacking. So they try kind of modern operating systems like Linux and Windows and Mac, etc. They they try to always load programs into different places in memory every time it boots and every time it stops. So it's more difficult to write, um, to, to hack into those machines. So it's just an additional level. And that, I think that is the reason why you get different numbers every time you exit. It's the same program. It's the same program. Well, the so question is not why the 6, 5, 6, 3, 4, 4 and 3, 4, 4, the second one. Oh, the question was why this kind of garbage is apparently... It's interesting that it's not even the same when you're executing it twice. We can't reason much about these numbers anyway. It's just that, uh, I thought the first time I saw it was different was around 10 years ago. And uh, I've just recently I realized it was because of a security mechanism that was gradually implemented in more and more uh, operating systems now. So now I'm going to show you something cool, and we already learned enough now, so we are able to actually look at this piece of shit. Very bad go. But what do you think it will print when I run it on my machine? You have seen my machine execute a few pieces of code already, uh, compiled without optimization. It will print 42. Doubt if you did compile with it with optimization, it will print. But it very good. Of course, it won't. It just say remove the index. <laughs> yeah. So this one prints forty-two exactly because, and we could say that because we understood about the stack and execution stack, etc. And this is useful knowledge, but we cannot rely on it. And if you could give a plausible explanation for it, you should feel both good and bad about it. You should feel bad because you are assuming something about underlying architecture that you are not really allowed to assume anything about. You should feel good, good about it because then you are able to explain what happens in the real world and you might be able to easier troubleshoot C programs that you need to debug. <coughs> and maybe you even uh, avoid falling into all the traps that are laid off you. Well, he doesn't know this. So for a person that doesn't know what usually typically happens when you execute the program, they tend to do what uh, we human beings are best at. If you don't understand it, you just come up with an explanation. And we believe very strongly in that explanation. <laughs> and Larry, he thinks there is a pool or named variables in the, in the, in the, in the machine <laughs> that uh, since we used A, the next time it's asking, give me an A. <laughs> <laughs> it just happens that the garbage value is in the A's 42 as well. And so he doesn't think it's strange at all that it's now 42 because of this name variable. And this is, yeah, you know. It's exactly what happened. For 13, or was it 1400 years, the humanity thought that all the moons and the sun and the stars that were revolving around the Earth. And for more than a thousand years, we were developing very fancy mathematics to describe how the 
stars, they were not going like this, they were going like this, at the cycles. <laughs> Around our wonderful world. So when a group of, when a whole world can actually believe in this kind of in, this is, this is kind of an invalid conceptual model about how the world is working. And if you have this kind of idea about how C is working, you tend to invent <laughs> <laughs> things like the name, the pool of named variables, like Larry just did. So I'm not going to spend time on this uh, slide, I'll just leave it there. But if you want <coughs> to <coughs> reason about C and C++ program, it is useful to just come up with a decent um, conceptual model about how the memory is laid out. And this is, this is a model that no machine implements directly, but which will give you approximately the right way of thinking. That there is something called a text segment with instructions. There is something called a data segment with static storage. And this is the one that is often meant at the zero from over there. This is sometimes called the DSS. Uh, and then there is an execution stack that grows and shrinks as you call functions. And it grows and shrinks with these kind of activation records that are, every time you call a function, an activation record go on the execution stack. And something happens and it pops out again. And the rest of the memory is used uh, as a heap and can be dynamically allocated. But this is, as you can know this, or you can think about the uh, execution like this, but you should know that as soon as the optimizer or anything kicks in, C doesn't have to kind of treat it like this at all. Um, because in C, um, it's all about behavior, as we will mention later. As long as it behaves as, then it's fine. <coughs> so, yeah, this is undefined behavior, and as you mentioned, if you compile with optimization, you typically get different results. Have ever, any one of you <laughs> experienced that you try to approach the compiler and it doesn't work? Or you change the optimization level and it doesn't work anymore? You must have. Yes. Yes, of course you have. Otherwise you haven't been programming enough. Because this is there are actually large development groups that are still stuck with old compilers. Because they don't dare uh, they, they have tried to use a new version compiler, but it doesn't work, so they stick to the old one. Because it works. And uh, yeah, so GCC 3.0, for example, or Visual Studio 6, for example, same problem. A lot of people are using Visual Studio 6. Or flags, hmm? like no strict aliasing. Um, yeah, and I, uh, they don't want to change optimization level because <laughs> then everything just crashes. And the reason is that they have, very often the reason is that they have undefined behavior. <coughs> and this is what you need to kind of consider when you talk about C. And that is, the standard talks about what kind of behavior should a C program have. So it talks about the implementation defined behavior, the unspecified behavior, and the undefined behavior. And it's also talking about recall of specific behavior. And examples of implementation defined behavior is for example this construct. Also what should happen when you right shift. Um, no, uh, sorry. What should happen if you right shift a very big uh, integer? So you overflow. It's implementation defined. It's unspecified which order um, the evaluation order here. So which one is executed first? So you don't know whether it's printing 42 or 24. And it's undefined what will happen if you have 
a very uh, the largest integer and you plus one to that one. Then you get undefined error. I think the can specify it like uh, it will always print two because printer returns the number of bytes written. So like, oh, no, but it's not printing anything. But it has a side effect. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a side effect we are looking for. We are not actually printing out the result of the simulation. Good. <coughs> and if you start reading all these kind of long, long, long lists about undefined behavior, and this is when you have undefined behavior, it's long, long list, it's Appendix J in C standard. And there is also this long, long list of unspecified behavior and implementation-defined behavior. You might think, this is a crap language. Let's use something else instead. But I argue that these kind of def defects in the language is one of the reasons why they are so successful. Because it's easy to write a compiler for it. Um, and it's possible to optimize a lot. And C doesn't impose a particular hardware architecture uh, that uh, uh, an instruction set on a particular architecture needs to follow, etc. So, Therefore, it's very convenient to implement the C compiler early and use it as the kind of the first above assembler language that you use on that architecture. So I think one of the really, really big successes of C is exactly these defects. And I think uh, C++ has uh, inherited this success because if you program C++, Correctly, you can uh, end up with a C++ program that is just as efficient as uh, C. So there is, it is actually possible to use C++ as a systems language program as well. It doesn't leave any room under C and C++ where they can sneak in a language that is better than C and C++. So therefore, C and C++ <coughs> will always be kind of the first language that comes after assembly language of that's my uh, assumption, my theory, for why we are still using these languages after 30 years, and why I'm sure that 30 years from now, we will still be using C and C++. <coughs> so, let's look at this one now. Now, I would like you to discuss again. Write down on your, if you have a piece of paper, write down what you think this will print out. And this is not undefined behavior. So this is perfectly valid C code. But it's unspecified behavior. Unspecified. Yeah, yeah. But uh, discuss with your partner and not me. I would like to have some kind of discussions going on. Write it down on the paper. Okay. Can I have some suggestions? What do you think it will print? Unknown for first row. Unknown for first row. 437 for second. Implementation. All right. So you think this one is. Well, it won't print unknown. Do you think some of the text will print unknown? Okay, let's start with the first one. 
What do you think, Mike, from the first of Three, four, seven. Three, four, seven is suggested? Four, four, three, seven. Yeah. Four, four, three, seven. Three, four, seven. Four, three, seven. Any other? But the point here is you are guaranteed to get either 347 or 437. That is a guarantee. You won't get kind of garbage or, or anything. You're guaranteed to get either of those two results. That's gar and, and you're guaranteed that 7 will come last. What about this one? Same being one was compressed. Four three seven is suggested. Same being compressed. Three four seven is suggested. Once again, you have a guarantee that it will either be three four seven or four three seven. That is guarantee that language is, but it's implementation specific uh, behavior or the fun behavior. So on my machine, if I do use GCC, I get three four seven four three seven. But if I use other compilers, I get different results. These are all 100% valid interpretation of this source code. And in practice, you, you might say, ah, oh, this is, doesn't have a practical value. But yeah, it does. During the 20 years I've been programming C and C++, well, actually more than 20 years now. Um, I've seen it happen a few times when inside these methods, there are big methods, and there is some logging going on, Maybe, especially in debugging. For instance, it's printing out something, or it's logging to a log file, and suddenly it just happens to kind of, it logs in, a, in an order that you didn't expect. Or it crashes. You thought that uh, this one would be evaluated first, but this one is printed and then it's crashing and everything is just confusing. But if you know that it's uh, unspecified, then it's easy to, or easier to reason about. So there are four valid interpretations of this sort of thing. <coughs> and to add to the confusion, if you are experienced in nearly every other programming language, this is new. Because uh, nearly any, every other programming language have a very strict evaluation order of things. So you can't use the experience you have from, from other uh, program language to assume how things are uh, evaluated. And Fortran also has the unspecified uh, evaluation order, though apart from that. So why do you think? The evaluation order is most specified. Let the compiler writer decide what's most efficient. You let the compiler writer decide uh, what is most efficient. Yes. You use the efficiency uh, <laughs> card. <laughs> okay. Uh, Which is always a good thing. If you know the assembly language, sometimes it's easier to do post yeah. uh, right to left stack arrangement or right to left. So the, the person who knows the lower language is in a position yeah. to do it. So it, doing that makes it easy to write the compiler. And it also gives an uh, optimization opportunity. And um, the reason why we go back to this one, if you look at the assembler code of what GCC typically produces, the reason why GCC often do it backwards here is because uh, then it can push the arguments on the stack. You can evaluate backwards and push the arguments on the stack before it's calling the function. Now that used to be a valid argument for doing it. Now they just do it for old habit. Because typically most um, uh, implementations of C and C++ now, they don't use the stack as much to send arguments over to the function. They use either three or six registers, which is quite typical, to pass the arguments over. Or some other type of thing. Okay. <coughs> what do you think this one will print? It's, it is. Uh, I heard. I heard three. I heard four. I heard four. 
This could be anything. The point, the point here is once again, I'm kind of reiterating the point, uh, the thing here about unspecified evaluation order. <coughs> and anything can happen since it's under fun behavior. Anything can happen. Trust me, I will show you an example afterwards that is a very strong argument for this. <coughs> There is this saying that when the compiler en uh, encounters ill-formed code, it is allowed to try to make nascent demons fly out of the house. That's a common saying that comes from uh, Usenet, posted uh, many years ago. <coughs> It's difficult to find compilers that are actually really pulling your pranks on you if they find the inform code. But there was, I have been told, I haven't seen it myself, but there, there used to be a GCC version that upon encountering a pragma that wasn't defined in the standard, it started net hack. Uh, or starting to play Toro or Hanoi or something that like that. Because anything can do. Anything can happen. Uh, and that's allowed by the C standard, so that's what GCC decided to do. <coughs> but it's crap cold, but do you know why? Can I explain why? It's not only because of the evaluation order, which if you know that evaluation order is uh, unspecified, it helps you on the way on trying to explain why this is uh, undefined behavior. But it doesn't, as I heard the word mentioned here earlier, there is a very, in the standard, there is kind of a very specific reason why this is uh, undefined behavior. Yeah? Doesn't actually build a value of i, it can't be. Yeah, it's, a, yeah, and that is accepting and getting it in the same. Yeah, that is that is a pragmatic explanation, which is very good, and I think that is demonstrating deep understanding. But at the same time, there is there is kind of a more specific reason for it. Of your genetic value and in between two sequence points. Yes, that's that's exactly what I was hearing from the standard. What Mike was saying is that you are updating a variable or updating and reading a variable twice between two sequence points. So the question here now, what is a sequence point? We will look at that later. Do you know what the sequence, where the sequence points are? One is uh, semicolon, uh, and conditional operator. Thank you for contributing, but it's not semicolon. <laughs> <laughs> and Larry will say it's a conditional No, it's equal to assignment. And this guy is, uh, it is line seven here. And the explanation, pragmatic explanation is that it doesn't know when I is being updated here. <clears throat> and it's, uh, um, you, you get undefined behavior if you try to read an update, the variable twice inside of an expression. Because you don't have a sequence point. You don't have any rules about sequencing. So you will have kind of an, you will have an unstable memory state. If you look at the assembler code, you will see that it's kind of reading a value into memory and then into a register, typically, and then updating it. And some compilers write it back into memory. Others just keep it in a register until you come to the sequence point where C gives a guarantee that all the side effects will take place and can be relied on after that. Well, he doesn't care. <clears throat> so if you don't understand the rules of sequencing in C and C++, this is the kind of bugs that you will stumble into all the time. So, what is this thing? Pen and paper time. <coughs> These snippets either print 42 or you should label it as undefined.
So does the first one print 42, or is it under five behavior? I'll write it down. All of it. Okay, number one. Are we hunting so sure about that? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's really a tragedy if it wasn't 42. <laughs> <laughs> what about the next one? No, not specified. Yeah, it's not specified. And it's not only not specified, it is now undefined behavior. What about the next one? 42. Yes, it is 42. And the difference between those two are that this one, you can call it a shortcutting operator, but that doesn't kind of, a short circuiting operator, but that doesn't really explain what happens. The thing is that this one introduces a sequence point. That is the reason why this one works. While this one does not introduce a sequence point. That is the reason why 2 is undefined and 3 is defined. What about the next one? 40. It will not print anything. 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 42. I told you it was either undefined or print 42. So. Okay, who thinks it's uh, printing 42? Who thinks it's not? It's not sure. But the thing is, this is guaranteed to print 42, but it's very useful to know why is it 42? Because there is no semicolon. <laughs> so the explanation isn't that kind of semicolon introduces uh, sequence points. The explanation is that this is a full expression. And in the standard it says that after evaluating a full expression, there will be a sequence point. That's what it says in the C99 standard. Um, and a full expression is an expression that is not a sub-expression of a larger expression, basically. So when you have kind of an, uh, an expression that should be evaluated, and it's not uh, part of a larger expression, it's a full expression, and you will have a sequence point. And this is guaranteed by the standard. And it's the reason why we can update it here before and use it here. So it's not about the sequence point. No, it's not about the um, semicolons. What about the next one? Then? Classical example of undefined behavior. And it's because this is also a full expression. But notice that within that expression, we are updating and reading the variable class. This one? Question mark. Uh, 42. <laughs> Whatever 42. <laughs> the thing is that if you look in the C99 standard, I have not been able, and I have asked a lot of people as well to please help me to explain this, but I've not been able to find kind of the chapter and verse combined together that really explains that this is guaranteed to be defined. However, in C9, in C11 that came out um, uh, two years ago, there are hardly any C11 compliant compilers out there in the market, so it's difficult to test. But you can test things like this in uh, in C11. There, here is kind of the chapter and verse about how to evaluate expression, and what they have done is they have added a line here. The value computation of the operands of an operator are sequenced before the value computation of the result of the operator. And using that line, it is possible to say that this one is guaranteed to be 42. 
But of course, if this one is a macro, <laughs> then you don't have um, this guarantee that it will have sequence points. So then you have underfound behavior. If it's a macro, you will probably have an underfound behavior. Okay. But what does food return as a macro? It's printing for the tuner. I thought about that. <laughs> so things are happening in the standard to kind of uh, make it better and better when it comes to sequence points. And actually now in sequence points, plus 11 and also C11, since there is support for concurrency, they had to update the memory model. And therefore, they have stopped using the sequence points as a concept. They are not talking about what is sequence before another thing. So the wording has changed. And uh, once I get hold of a C11 compiler, I will start updating these slides according to the current there is no C11 compiler. So many changes between C11 and C9? Hmm? A lot of changes between C11 and C9. Yeah, there are some significant and really cool changes there, but uh, but uh, it doesn't seem to attract much attention from the compiler writers because you don't get C11 compiled compilers these days. But the thing is, going back to sequence point, the thing is that conceptually we have this idea that there are a lot of sequence points in the program. So the thing is um, that there are not so many. And the rules are like this, two simple rules. Between previous and the next sequence point, an object shall have its stored value multiplied at most once by the evaluation <coughs> of the and The next rule is furthermore, the prior value shall be read only to determine the value to be stored. That is the rules. We tend to think it has a lot, because that's what we're, for example, I used from, from Java or C sharp or any other language, they are so, they move so slowly while evaluating the expression. They have a big expression and they evaluate it bit by bit by bit by bit, certain, following all the rules laid down by the standard. What do you think a C compiler does? Take the whole expression <laughs> and create a long expression pipeline and show it through the CPU <laughs> much faster because it doesn't need to care about which order to evaluate things. Until there is a sequence point, and the state needs to, state needs to be restored. <coughs> so, I just leave the, this slide is just left in the, so people can read it later. I will publish the slides, of course. This is the condensed version of Portable Minute. Uh, well, the one on the net is two years Order. old. Yeah. Order, uh, this is this has more explanations, etc. And uh, so, the, if you if you don't want to kind of read the standard and understand it all, when it comes to sequence points, you get a decent conceptual model if you understand these five things. You have a sequence point after evaluating a full expression. You have a sequence point. Uh, after evaluating the arguments and just before the actual call to a function, you have a sequence point at logical and a logical or. And that is the reason why you can guarantee a left to right evaluation. You have a sequence point at the comma operator. And you have sequence points on this uh, ternary operator. That's where you have sequence points. Like this. And it's not at the same point. That is interesting. <laughs> okay, now we have seen this snippet a few times. There is a reason why I did plus plus a instead of a plus plus. Because I have met several programmers, believe me or not, that when I write it like this, which of course is four plus four. But they think it prints 333. This is scary. Initially, I was like, what is going on here? This is so strange. How can it possibly think it's going to? So I was just like Larry. That's my attitude. What's happening here? Until I started thinking about this. Well, 
understanding when the side effect takes place is not so easy after all. So, and I realized that a lot of these programmers, well, I haven't met so many, but I met, I met a few that thinks this one plays with three. They have this idea that the variables, that you, when you do it like this, it's updated when you go out to the block. <laughs> but at the same time, did you really know about sequence points? Did you have a valid understanding of when side effects took place? And if you didn't, you shouldn't laugh so loud about those who think this is 3 to 3, even though it's a bit sudden. Um, so, um, yeah, just to illustrate the point that if, if you don't understand it completely, then you tend to end up creating your own beliefs that it's being updated after the block or after the semicolon, as some people think. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so, strange explanations are often a symptom of having an in, uh, invalid conceptual model. This is. Perfectly valid C code. There is no unspecified behavior here. There is no undefined behavior. I just felt I needed to have something that was kind of clean, pure C. It works exactly as it's supposed to be. It's portable and so on. What do you think these five groups of commands write out? This is with your partner. Okay, the first one. What is going to print out the first one? Dot. You mean that? Are you sure about that? Any other suggestions? Then you obviously understand something very, very important. What about the next one? Good. The next one. Short. The body that is ready to be inside the three. Should be the same. Three. We can accommodate. Short. One one four. Short. What about this one? Four? Did I hear not? So four. No, four. I can hear uncertainty in the room here. So four. It's a four. four. And the last thing. It's a. It is a one. The thing here is, I, I think you did very well, and I, I think this is very difficult to reason about. Whenever I come into this kind of thing, that oh, what's really going on here? Because you, in order to answer these things, you have to understand kind of the promotion and the motion rules of integer uh, uh, in, in C and C++. You have to know things like that the short, since it's smaller than the end, it will be promoted to the end and compared. And I said this was portable and it will be the same as compiler. I take that back. Is that possible? Because I, I think you will get some problems if short is the same size as int. Yeah. But if it's <coughs> if it's shorter than int, then it can be promoted. But if it's the same size as int, then it cannot be promoted. So you will get different results. <coughs> On depending on the size of these types. But kind of the guideline here is, of course, you should never compare uh, signed and unsigned ints. But notice, this is something that you probably do all the time, 
because I bet a lot of you are indexing into arrays by using ints instead of size t. Don't do that. Because size t is the right way of indexing into an array. Ints are not the right way to do it. And this is the type of problems that you will get. You will notice very much if you try to uh, um, porch code from, say, a 32-bit architecture to a 64-bit architecture. It will just overload you with warnings and bugs and errors because you have been using uh, assigned integer value to kind of index into memory. And that's not good, especially when you are porting between different uh, word sizes and functions. Uh, yeah. 32 bit isn't a long the same size as an int? The standard doesn't say anything about that. <laughs> <laughs> so sometimes, yeah, could be. The only thing the standard says is that long should be at last. It shouldn't be smaller than it. So you have to say long. And it doesn't give. It also gives you a guarantee that it will not be shorter than thirty-two bit. But yeah. apart from that, it doesn't. And you have to say long, long to get sixty-four bit in thirty-two. Oh, on some machines, you can do long, long. Uh, but that depends. We need to use uh, the uh, STD in. Yeah, one good way of uh, treating this is that you are using stdint.h that came with the C99 uh, C99 standard, and then you have mechanisms for a reason about certain sizes, etc. Okay, we talked about integers. Let's continue with integers. <laughs> what about this one? Looks kind of innocent, doesn't it? It's, uh, even though it's an idiotic algorithm, of course, I, I just wanted to create something, something short. But I'm quite sure that some of you, at some point, have written an, uh, a function that takes an integer and then do something with that integer later on. I did exactly the same mistake a while back, yeah. trying to do a binary search on a 4GB array. Yes. Left plus right by two. <laughs> Left and right are greater than two. So you got the problem with it? No. Because there is a guarantee in the C standard kind of, that it will not create code that you have not asked for. Because if you are going to do this correctly, you will have a lot and lot of if statements, etc., checking if we are near the boundary, and if we are near the boundary of an integer, then certain things can happen. Because here, what happens if you put in a large integer, instead you get sign integer overflow, and that is um, the one behavior. So, now anything can happen, and once again, what does it print? <laughs> <laughs> and Larry is confused. Inconceivable. <laughs> <laughs> and the thing out. Okay, now it's time for me to. Now I've been showing a lot of toy examples where I just say that anything can happen. But I'm going to show you a real example that I think is so cool. But remember that you will not get code you haven't asked for. And in this case, I think it's something like 25 lines of code you need to uh, implement if you're going to do treat overflows correctly. Well, it's, it's a fairly complex algorithm actually to kind of treat boundary values correctly. Exercise. What do you think might happen if you run this code? I showed you earlier a piece of code where I showed that the interpretation of this code can result in four different results. So what do you think can happen? Notice it's undefined behavior. We all will know that. Discuss with uh, the people around you. And some of you might have seen the uh, seen this before and know that what will, might happen. But until I saw it myself, I have to admit 
I didn't believe this could ever happen. Okay. <laughs> okay, so the suggestion is that it can either print true or print false. It depends on kind of the garbage line that we get. Can print Mm -hmm. It can be true and false both. Uh, both. Can it? No. Yes. It basically, uh, it, uh, it's a multiprocess system, and after uh, first check, it is shifted. The process is gone. Unlike your answer. The continuity is switched, and the variable is reset. It can be false true again, and the false can come as. Okay, yeah, that's. I like your answer, because um, although that's not what's happening yet. It's, you are kind of illustrating the point that the handwritten in the quantum computer that can stop. <laughs> <laughs> so just to kind of test this thing, let's call it first call bar and then foo. And in bar we are just kind of poking some garbage into the stack area that we think this one will use. So now I'm poking the value two into the memory area that this bool might be using. And then I use my three compilers, and I run it without optimization. And since I'm now going to show you assembler code, uh, I find it much easier to read 32-bit assembler. And it doesn't make any difference, really. It just makes it easier to read. So when, I'm, when I compile C code and try to study what the compilers are doing, I tend to use uh, I386 instruction set and normally 32-bit white. It's convenient, and I have so far I have not seen any example that it makes any difference. So the Intel compiler in this case gave me true. That's a fair one. Is that what they expected? Plan gave me false, and GCC gave me true and false. Thanks to um, Mark Schroyer that uh, blogged about this one in uh, June last year, and it was uh, became very popular and, and read by many. And uh, I also read it, and I immediately fired up my compilers and I started looking at the assembler to figure out what is really happening here. And I'm not going to show it to you. With optimization, though, you get false, false, false. So, it's looking at the number of time. Since we have some time for that. We have time. <laughs> this is a piece of code. We run it through the ICC compiler without no optimization. And I don't expect you to read this very quickly, so I will help you by writing it back into C again. So this is what you should focus on. <coughs> It's creating, th this is uh, a one-to-one -one relationship to what you see here, so you can trust me, this is what I'm <laughs> It basically takes the random value in the memory, and uh, without optimization, it's using the stack. So ICC is actually using stack here on my machine. Then it's loading that stack memory area into register A. It's comparing register A with zero, and if it is zero, then it's jumping over through. Then it is loading B again into register A, and exactly as we said, if there was kind of um, something messing up in the memory area, it could actually change in between because this is not atomic operation. In which case, it might bring nothing also. Hmm? It might be a case where it brings nothing. Yeah, Same reason. yeah it could. So it's uh, loading B into memory again. Then into register again, check whether it's not zero. <coughs> and if it's not zero, it's jumping over. And this is actually kind of working as most programs expect. It should be. So if the random value is zero, it's false. If it's one, it's true. And if it's anything else, then it's true. If we put on optimization, this is what's going to happen. It doesn't care about memory at all. It just uses whatever is in the register A. And register A 
in here it's actually EAX register. And do you know how you can change the EAX register? Of course, I immediately went into and did that, and I could kind of control true or false values being printed. How can you change one easy way of changing the register A, uh, EAX? So when, <coughs> when it is returning something, it is yes. EAX is very often used as the return value. So, for example, if you print out three characters, the EAX register will often be three. So, do that and then call this function and things are happening. But anyway, it just takes this uh, random value that whatever it has in the A register or EAX register here, compare that to zero, and if it's not zero, it's jumping over and printing true. If it is zero, it's printing false. So once again, it kind of does approximately what we think. But no chance with the graphics. It's still combined as two if, uh, if blocks into one if block. Hmm? Yeah. Basically, it combined two if blocks yeah, into that's, one that's if that's block. Good. But that was nice to see from five. With plan, with no optimization, what's happening is it's taking this random value and checking the last bit, it doesn't load it into register, checking the last bit with one. And if it's one, then it prints true. And if it's, um, sorry, uh, it's checking the last bit for one, and if the last bit is one, it's printing true. If it's zero, then it's printing false. So this is what you get. Even numbers is false, odd numbers are true. So that's fine, without it. With optimization, however, this is what's happening. I will reveal the answer now. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't do anything, it just plays false. <laughs> That's simple clear, is it? It's undefined behavior. Anything can happen. Anything is valid. That's yes, it's false. Did it Jeez. convert a printf into puts? Hmm? Did it convert a printf into puts? Yes, uh, there used to be a saying that you should never use printf uh, when you only have a string. Yeah. But most compilers now tend to uh, replace printf with one argument into puts if it's, uh, the one argument is ended by uh, slash, backslash f. <coughs> because it's a behavior. The language is there often, often called the uh, uh, behavioral focused languages. As long as the behavior is the same, it can do whatever. So it can replace printf with puts. So don't be surprised if you if you put your debugger on printf, <laughs> nothing is happening. It's because it might be calling puts instead. So, well, this was Clang. We just look at that. This is GCC. Oh, sorry. This is GCC. This was what I fired up immediately when I saw this article. And it took a while, a few minutes. So it's, it's hard to read for me. Even if, even if I write uh, assembler once in a while, not very often, I, I find it hard to kind of follow this one. But eventually I realized, oh, so of course, that's what's happening. And uh, it's taking the random value and checking against zero. And if it's zero, then it jumps over three. Then it's taking that random value again, loading it into a register, an X score with one. And then it checks the register with zero again and jump over it to zero. Now, if the garbage value in B is zero or one, this algorithm actually works. It will print zero if it's um, no, false if it's zero, and true if it's. But if it's two, that's the bit pattern one zero. It will go in here, the bit pattern one zero equal to zero. Nah. So we print three. Then it goes down there. It loads a one zero bit pattern one zero into the register again, 
XOR with 1, so you get 1, 1, 3, compares 3 with 0, nah, it's not 0, so it prints false. So that's the reason why you get true and false when you run the GCC head. <coughs> We have broken the rules of the language. The compiler can do whatever. When we optimize GCC, they are inspired by the clan gang or the other way around. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> so this is kind of the possible outcomes that I have seen. But since it's under the behavior, absolutely anything can happen. Basically, it's going to flow through those, etc. Um, and I think what is happening here, but I don't know that, but I've, I've talked to a few compiler writers and they say, hey, yeah, that might, that might be a reasonable kind of explanation, as long as you don't understand all the things that we understand, um, which I don't. Um, but I think what is happening is that when they, you run the optimize, uh, optimizer, you're kind of building a tree that you start a, a big tree that you start applying optimization rules on to kind of collapse this tree into a smaller and smaller unit until it's very small and you can't make it smaller and then generate the code. I suspect that the reason why you get this kind of just print false is that once you have undefined behavior and invalid code here, the tree that is built, and when you apply the rules, suddenly things are kind of just falling apart. That, in a way, you could say it shouldn't have been falling apart, and it just reduces it into false and things. That's just as good. I don't. I'm not sure if I believe that the compilers actually understand this code well enough, because if you put on the compiler flags and so on, you don't get warnings about this. <coughs> so I think it's just a result of having an invalid code building up a huge tree that is going to be optimized. You apply a lot of rules to kind of reduce it into something smaller and it just collapses into a unity print I might be wrong, but that's what I could be. I, I think that it might be a possible explanation. So going to, back to the very beginning again, where we started. So what's really wrong with this code? I guess we all agree it's crap, okay? Everyone agrees it's crap code, yeah, yeah. But at the same time, you can write this one in Java, or C Sharp, or a lot of other languages, and it will be perfectly valid code, and it will give you exactly the same result on every machine. So it's not uncommon in other programming languages to actually do these kind of things, to update the variable twice. In, a, in an expression like this. So it's crap code. What about this statement? The standard says that this is a valid code. Yeah, yeah, maybe. It's crap and bad because you update a variable multiple times between two semicolons. It is undefined behavior because and then between two sequence points, an object is modified more than once or is modified and the prior value is read other than to determine, determine the value to be stored. Uh, you modify and use the val value of a variable twice between sequence points. And then here is the last statement that I'm going to show. In C and C++. So the question is, what's wrong with this code? In C and C++, unlike most other languages, the order in which sub-expressions are evaluated and the order in which side effects take place, except as specified for a function call, AND operator, OR operator, determiner operator, and comma operator, is unspecified. Therefore, the expression here does not make sense. This is kind of the perfect, the scholarly example, that will kind of answer which is good. You can do nothing wrong by saying the things like that. But I have to say I like this one better. This one is demonstrating a deep understanding of the language. This one 
probably some understanding of language, but it could also be something that my, my mother, she remembers very well. So she could actually read this and just say it. Um, doesn't necessarily mean that she understands C program. This demonstrates uh, understanding. This demonstrates that you can repeat something that you have read. <laughs> this one, I feel this is kind of leading you in the wrong direction. If you are talking about kind of updating a variable between sequence points, you kind of create yourself an explanation for something that you tend to stick to, and that will eventually just lead you into trouble. So sequence uh, points are not defined by the semicolons. The standard says that this is invalid code. Yeah, maybe. It does, but at the same time, it's a questionable attitude to have. And that is, if you don't understand the whole C standard, then you're not allowed to write C code. Kind of thing. And nobody can remember the whole C standard. So I think it's better to kind of try to reason about these things so you can come up with a good explanation, create yourself a good conceptual model about what it means to program in C and C++. But finally, of course, we all agree with this graph. It is common to think about this kind of stuff that I've been talking about. Do you have five more minutes? Yeah. We have a venue for at least an hour more. Okay. Yeah. Oh, right. Okay. <laughs> uh, approximately five more minutes, and then we can uh, do a QA session if we want to that. Um, it's common to think that these things is not so important. But the problem is that if you have undefined behavior somewhere in your code, then the whole code base, basically, is also have undefined behavior. And it's not... And so the, the thing is that when you have kind of uh, the runtime environment passes through the undefined behavior, it will get a corrupt state, and when it's executing the rest of the code, it might do the wrong thing. But it's not only the runtime environment that is uh, influenced by this. Because you can actually have the compilers also influenced by this. It's first compiling a piece of code with undefined behavior. And the compiler also has a state that it needs to care about. And the state might be corrupt, so it generates bugs other places in your code. I haven't seen concrete examples of that mm -hmm. happening. But I believe it happens. I mean, I believe, really believe it happens. And uh, there are some people that say, yeah, then, although they can't show it to me, they have seen corrupt states in the compilers that generate crap other places if you have undefined behavior here. So you don't, you can actually get strange results even if you're never executing the, uh, the invalid code. <coughs> But who is releasing code with undefined behavior? Well, I don't know. I just heard stories about it. But from from my my own experience, I during the well, I started to work professionally in 1996. So for 17 years, I have been working with programming and C and C++ mostly. Banking and insurance applications. I've been developing. I know that I have undefined behavior. At least no one knows. And it's not only me. I've been developing traffic systems, for seismic systems, for supercomputers, banking terminals, and now for the last nine years I've been working on metallic presence uh, systems. All of these systems have a new behavior. I know that personal experience. And for example, for this one, I'm currently working together with a group of 200 developers in the same code base, all in C and C++, four or five million lines of code. We have loads of undefined behavior in there. Uh, I can give an example. So if you go back a couple of slides, the code that you, you might not think somebody would release code like this, yeah. but I have actually seen that eight end line in code yeah. where somebody's trying to read the, read the start of a buffer yeah. plus macro that reads a byte stream yes. comment. Yes, it very often happens with macros actually. When the macros kicks in, 
you don't realize that you actually get on the quadrilateral. So the code is like I plus hmm. read length from current buffer, yeah. which is modifying the position that you're adding to. Yes. <laughs> yeah, but it's, it's true. That's that's thing you see in real code bases. Um, excellent example. <laughs> Well, there, there are people that build other types of systems as well. I, mean, I can't say anything about other types of systems, but sometimes I think if I'm involved in releasing um, programs with undefined behavior, then maybe somebody else is involved in it as well. <clears throat> and you might think that the compiler writers, they know. <laughs> they know how to do this. So... Uh, I, I told you I have three compilers on my machine, but that's not actually true. I, I think I have five or six compilers. Um, because I have also been compiling up the portable C compiler. And I have a tiny C compiler and, uh, and another one, which I can't remember the name of. When I compile the portable C compiler with the latest GCC version, 4.9, and the latest GCC version is really good at finding undefined behavior. I got this one. Do you not notice what happens here? We are actually updating the variable twice between two sequence points. You might look at this and say, why well, should they do that? But at the same time, this is a compiler, an open source compiler. I'm not sure if it's free. Well, I think it's a free software. That has been out there for many, many, many years. It has had thousands of eyeballs looking into this code. And it's written by very clever people, and still they are releasing with uh, undefined behavior. And it's that's 1.0.0 in 2011. So the final word is stop thinking about C and C++ as high level languages because they are not. They are more like portable assemblers with all the defects that you can expect from portable assemblers. You must have an understanding of what happens under the hood. But I believe, because if you don't understand what happens under the hood, you will just be a kind of a bug creating machine. <laughs> but if you do have a useful mental model of what happens under the hood, then I strongly believe you have a chance. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay, I can, uh, if you allow, I can do a QA session on the media. So, and I also encourage you to kind of, uh, if you feel you have to leave, that you can kind of sneak out quietly and <laughs> don't feel bad about that, because then I know that the people in the room they want to be here. So I, I can take questions if there are. So one of the things, one of the patterns I've noticed, I've run into by accident, yep. is the same variable being defined twice in a scope. The same variable being I mean, defined twice in a scope. So yep. an int i outside and an int i inside a loop. That's okay. But that's okay. That's okay. Uh, that is defined behavior. C99 is okay. No, it's okay, but the fact that if you also in C99. Oh, sorry. Let's, uh, yeah. No, it's a, it's an anti pattern. But yeah. if you actually happen to see that at some point or the other, you do not know which one you're actually. Yeah, you can. The question is kind of variables hiding. Yeah. Um, but this is something that as that is actually sometimes useful. It's it's a good practice to try to avoid it. Yeah. But at the same time, it's, it's important that the language supports it, that it can happen. And uh, as you know, in C99, you can uh, declare and define a variable and then place in, inside a block. You don't have to do it in the top of the block. Yeah. In C99, you could, in some way, you could also define it very close to usage whenever you need it. You just have to kind of create a new block so that you could define it immediately. But yeah, it's. Uh, Kind of name hiding, as you described there, is a potential bug, but it's still defined behavior. Yes? Thanks for the talk. I think you shared a number of insights, both from the perspective of 
someone using C for adding more awareness with respect to what they're doing. Mm. Uh, towards the end of the slide, right, clearly some of the things that you shared were examples of systems that are safety critical systems. Yes. Now, sort of, what do you think is the way forward? Because with a lot of C code examples like this, where it is hard to trust developer judgment with some of this, and it doesn't look like advances with some of the sort of static analysis of the code base that can help us yeah. identify such problems. Are there some new things which would help us avoid some of this? Uh, yeah, there is. The, the kind of sad part of the answer is that I, I think we will always struggle with this. And um, I think we will be programming just as much C and C++ 30 years from now as we do today. Remember that when you are developing in Ruby and Scala and all the cool languages that are typically in an application programming domain. But half of the software industry and probably an increasing half of the software industry is actually working with embedded systems like microwave ovens, cars, jet fighters, uh, telepresent systems, telephones, mm -hmm. This one. Hmm? This one. Yeah, mobile phones, uh, presenter controllers, etc. And these typical embedded systems, there is currently no good alternative to CNC++. Yeah. So your car with its 250 CPUs and uh, estimated 200 million lines of code, a lot of that will be in C++ and, and C with other kind behavior. So that is the sad part of the answer. The good part Kind of the positive answer to that is that, fortunately, the industry is moving forward. And during the last decade, something extremely important has happened in programming. Does anyone want to suggest what I might be thinking of? Concurrency. Hmm? Concurrency. Okay, that's making it worse in some way. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but uh, there is another thing I'm thinking of. Okay, so you yes, test-driven development. That you should not write any code before you have a test to check whether you are doing the right thing or not. And this is a technique that some programmers use a lot uh, and find it useful. I'm not saying that TDD is the solution to everything. But it's also a technique that, unfortunately, a lot of programmers don't know about. And to me, that's a bit, now in 2013, that's a bit like having a carpenter that doesn't know how to use the nail gun. He's using his hammer. <laughs> and then you see those developers that know that in development, so which is like, <laughs> and really uh, doing a quick, fast job. It looks like the, the TDD people are working slowly because they are doing two things at once, but they are hitting the target all the time you know, because they are just trying to satisfy a test that they just want. So I believe that going in the direction of learning more about implementation techniques and TDD being one of them, which can be compared to kind of double bookkeeping in finance. And there are actually, you know that accountants can be put in jail if they don't uh, do double bookkeeping. There are also people that say uh, programmers should be put in jail if they don't use that at all. I don't know, but it's an interesting argument. I believe that uh, the answer to your question is that we need to be more humble as programmers and we need to kind of start to learn the programming techniques that can reduce the number of bugs in our systems. Is there room for sort of more model checking or? To help with inspection of code. Uh, I th the question is whether there are room for uh, more tools. I think there will always be room for more, <coughs> more tools like yeah, Lint and Coventi and Copworks, etc. that was mentioned. There is a tool on market for that. But the nature of C and C++ is in such a way that it's impossible for a tool to completely understand what you're trying to do as a program. So we will, it will just be moving the boundaries of where we can fall off the cliff. So we need to, we need to start moving more slowly with C and C++ programs so that we don't fall off the cliff without having the, kind of the protection of uh, tools. That's, that's what I'm doing. 
Yes? So you do test driven development. Well. <laughs> 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 I I certainly give a lot of talks about this. <laughs> so I have good company with all those people that are just traveling around talking about how fantastic it is. But it is, yes, I do. Uh, t TDD is actually my default technique now. Even for the very simplest thing that I'm trying to do. Uh, I look at the problem and uh, then I do TDD. But I don't use TDD because of this. I use TDD because I find it an extremely valuable tool to avoid analysis parallel analysis parallel. Para <laughs> I've been talking for three days now. Um, <laughs> paralysis. Um, because usually as a software developer when you move into a new domain, you don't understand really the requirements. Nobody understands the requirements. Even those people that come and say what you should make doesn't understand the requirements. So instead of stop seeing the requirement and what, uh, what you're going to solve, and stop and stop thinking, thinking, analyzing, analyzing, it's usually much better to kind of move slowly into the domain and try things. And while I'm doing that, I try to make small steps while discovering more about the domain I'm uh, trying to solve uh, or do a solution in. And that seems to have the double effect of also making sure that I'm not writing code that I don't have tests for. So I would say TDD is my default implementation technique, but I don't use it always. So uh, 60, 70% of the time, I try to dive into first with TDD, and then I make a decision of whether I should continue or not. Other times I dive in by what is called faith, or Faith-driven development, or <laughs> some kind of fluff-driven development. I get some magic fluff on my head, and I write it code, and it's probably going to work. Um, sometimes I do that, and then I realize, oh, I need to be more serious in this test driven development and stuff. So I think your approach is very good, but the question is, do you, how do you test with different compilers with test driven development? How do you test these undefined behaviors? <laughs> in uh, our code base, and we have been working with trying to reduce undefined behavior now for we have an active approach for the last eight years, I would say, in our progress. <coughs> so we are, from where we were eight years ago, we are in a fantastic state now, but at the same time we have become so humble in what we are trying to solve here that we are really eager to kind of move on in the, in the right direction. And of course we are using all the tools that we have mentioned so far. Um, the thing is that if you create an awareness among all your developers, and, and I mentioned we were around 150, 200 working on the same code base, all the issues that we have been talking about today, but also you try to make sure that everyone is writing kind of compliant code, then it's much easier to switch compilers. So one of the things that we do, for example, we encourage developers to use different compilers so that different developers discover different things. So some, some of our developers, they are, every night they are compiling a new version of GCC from kind of the bleeding edge of, uh, of the core track. Others are using Clang. Some are using, some modules can actually be compiled with ICC as well. And these compilers give different results. So, one way of dealing with it is to make sure that you don't start relying on a uniform development environment because then you might have all these bugs and inconsistency without ever discovering them until someone says, oh, maybe we should buy a new compiler. Upgrade your compilers frequently. Sorry? Upgrade your compilers frequently. Yeah, Which you change compilers frequently. Yeah, and that's, that's a probably a good approach. And, and also to try to make sure that uh, you know, your team of developers are using different development tools so that you get used to dealing with uh, different uh, behaviors. What's your framework for testing in C? Uh, my favorite test framework for testing in C, which I'm kind of famous for because I published a paper on it and, uh, and a lot of people are now, oh yeah, he thinks that is a good thing. It's called a search. 
So I include assert.h, and then I write a lot of assert statements uh, in my test code. Um, I think that works perfectly, and it's, it's what I recommend. Um, there are a lot of tools out there for doing test driven development. Uh, Google test is very popular. You have C++ unit test, you are in C, C unit, and so on and so on. And I have nothing wrong to say about those uh, frameworks because they are doing a great job. But there is one downside of using them, and that is the tools, they become so overwhelming. It's not like a small, sharp tool like a search that you can just always carry around and use when you need to. It's like this big, big, massive thing. And everyone move away because here I come with my test framework. <laughs> <laughs> and that, I think that is one of the reasons why people are reluctant to test frameworks. Because they know what happens when they say, oh, should we try this test, uh, the TDD thing? And then someone says, yeah, 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 just wait here. <laughs> Everybody now, do it like this. So, a search.h, that's a good starting point. And once you get used to doing test driven development by the search.h, you can consider something bigger. Uh, so have you seen something called CCAN? Um, CCAN? It's like a CPAN for C programmers. So, it comes with something called the failure mode. Okay. Which basically LD preloads malloc, yeah. and every time malloc is called, it forks one where it returns null, and one where it returns a value. Okay. Value. I I love I love those kind of tools. And it makes sure the one you return null exits. Yeah. And and there are loads of those kind of tools, small kind of tools that you can apply, and then you get see your code from a different perspective. Um, and we develop a lot of them in house as well. Um, to, to test the bits. Yes? So, I had a question regarding, uh, or your thoughts regarding this subject. Um, most of modern GPUs have compilers. They are very... Modern? GPUs. GPUs, graphics. Okay. okay. Yeah, that's a statement that I cannot say yes or no to. Um, but, um, and, and the language, the shading language is very much like C. Mm -hmm. um, and you typically give, give out the shaders as a source code, yeah. and there's undefined behaviors across three different GPUs, mm. and there's no standard on it, yeah. right? because that's what the inherent manufacturers develop the compilers for. Yeah. Um, so coming from a C background, and getting into GPUs, which are more evident today in the market, so do you have any thoughts on the subject as to how these compilers would work across systems which use the same language definition, but... Well, in the context that I'm in now, as long as it's not about standard C or standard C++, I don't have many thoughts about it. Um, in the pub afterwards, or in the dinner, or whatever we are going to do afterwards, um, I am willing to talk about that Sharp and Go and Ruby and Scala and all those languages. Yeah. And also maybe I heard more about how the GPU <coughs> is working. But it is, it is uh, when it comes to, not talking about GPU, when it comes to CPUs and microcontrollers, it's a very common belief that, oh, we have all the developed all the tools we need for us and things. But the thing is that every single day there comes out a new chip, an architecture that needs something more than assembly language. And those kind of chips, they will often get C first as the language to program. And that's why it's so important to learn C properly, so that your code can also work in those type of CPUs. That's not a good answer for the GPU evaluation that you raised, but uh, that was my attempt. Yes? Uh, from the slides, actually, uh, sequence points always is a pain point. <laughs> so you have mentioned that function forms a sequence point. Uh, it's, is it basically that one a function call completes the basically you invoke the function call, all the things are evaluated, or is it for the, each of the arguments? How does it apply there as a sequence point? Uh, it is uh, the rule for the, the question was uh, about sequence points when it kind of kicks in regarding question calls. So that was number five I listed. 
It's basically that the whole expression um, is evaluated. It's evaluated and you have a sequence point just before you call the function. Now, if you have the common separator, it's a different common separator than the one I mentioned in the rule of three. Yes. Because that is the parameters. You don't have any. Um, you don't have any guarantee in which order those um, uh, arguments are evaluated. The only thing you know is that all of them will be completed with their evaluation and the side effect has taken place before the program count removes into the subroutine. Uh, that's the guarantee. As, as far as I understand it. Uh, It's kind of funny because in some situations, maybe like this, I feel that I, I know a bit about C++. But then I go to some types of conferences, like the ACCU conferences, for example. I recommend that one. And you stand there somewhere and you realize that there are like 20 people around you that knows 100 times more about this than I do. Um, then you feel very small. <laughs> So, for every type of new knowledge that I, I acquire about C and C++, I start realizing that there is so much more I need to learn about C++. For example, in difficult cases, uh, when is the sequence point happening? And in the new standards, both C11 and C++11, it's not called sequence points anymore, it's called sequence before. So it's talking about sequencing, and as soon as you introduce concurrency, <laughs> Ridiculously <laughs> difficult. Thanks, everyone. So that was fantastic. Yeah.